Thank you. Thank you so much for a very, very nice introduction and, and also for hosting me here and inviting me over um, to be here. Um, I was here a couple of years ago at a, at a conference and I enjoyed being here and I'm so glad to be back and I really am thankful for all of you coming and, and listening to me. Um, I am quite very passionate about education as well as research and this is a great forum for me to share with you um, some of the things we've been doing and, and, and sort of give you an idea of how we think about research and how we do things and how kind of inspiration we're getting from the work we do. Um, so the, the title is Bio-Inspired Materials and um, um, you see a little spider here um, in this picture. So we get quite a bit of inspiration from little insects like spiders and other things in nature um, that really help us in advancing our ability to engineer things. Um, and you can see you know, quite a few different things, in fact, that we can do with this. Um, in a very simple way, um, what we're trying to, to achieve in my lab, um, in my group, is to engineer things um, from very, very tiny scales of atoms and molecules, which you can see here down here, um, so of the chemical scale of things, um, all the way up to structural things. This is what you typically associate with civil engineering, our structures and buildings. Um, our work really deals with bridging the scales between the structures and the buildings um, um, through the material, um, through the chemistry, all the way down to the very, very tiny scales of atoms and how we put them together. So um, I put this little picture here and I say, um, frontier or mesoscale, the hard thing, of course, is um, controlling these intermediate scales, right? Because we are, uh, if you talk to the chemists, they can tell you how to make certain molecules. Um, if you speak to the architects and civil engineers, they can teach you, uh, teach you how to make a building. Um, but it's really hard to control the intermediate scales. And that's where a great opportunity lies in achieving more with less, um, which drives a lot of the work we do. Um, more functions with less energy, um, more properties, better strength, um, um, with less material, etc. So I'll show you um, how we can do this. And it's an exciting field because, um, in fact, it is very inspirational, right? So we, we try to see, look at natural systems like spider webs, which are beautiful structures. It asks very fundamental questions like, how do spider webs, how are they built? Um, how do spiders make this material? Um, and they obviously uh, do this by, uh, by eating prey. So they use, in fact, the web in uh, eating insects and flies. And then they make a spider web and they build um, cocoons. Um, and they do this by using silk as a way, as a very diverse um, sort of a material in creating many different functions. On the web, um, they create cocoons. You've seen those. Um, in fact, spiders can make more than seven different types of silks, um, different kinds of materials. So they can tailor um, what kind of building material they need um, as they live and as they build things. So very fascinating stuff. And if you're an engineer, of course, um, you might admire the beauty of those webs, but what you really care about are the numbers, right? And so you go into the lab and you start testing silk and you know, um, many of you are mechanical, civil, materials engineers probably. Um, how do you characterize the strength? Well, you take a tensile test machine, right? And you pull a piece of material and you divide the force you need to break it by the cross-sectional area to account for how much material you have. And if you do this for silk, you'll find that the strength um, is something on the order of a gigapascal. That is a strength you find in steel. It's a human-made engineered material that has been um, created, in fact, using a lot of energy. And here comes the spider um, and produces a material like steel, same strength, um, actually much tougher than steel because it's a lot more difficult to break silk than steel. Um, it makes this at room temperature um, without a steel plant, without energy, um, simply by self-assembly. So this material really is put together almost on its own by the spider um, from the food they eat, the protein they eat, and processed in the spider, uh, and makes these beautiful structures. Now, the key to achieving those extreme properties really is a very uh, articulate way of controlling structure at all different length scales. Right? You've seen um, the web, uh, you can see those protein molecules, but the spider is able to control a lot of different things in between, right? which are these, um, the way these silk proteins are combined to forming a nanostructure, the way they form fibrils, the form they form fibers, and eventually the fibers are used to build webs. So spiders have this uh, amazing ability in doing this, and in fact, uh, engineers are very um, envy of this, of course. Um, there's a lot of um, 
attempts at copying this. Um, the problem is, and the challenge, that we can't really do this yet because we don't understand even how spiders do it, right? And so um, the work we do is trying to solve this mystery and understanding how spiders do it and then replicating it in our labs. We're not trying to only understand as engineers, but we're trying to build on what we understand and creating our own things. And our own things might not be spider webs. There might be um, buildings. There might be new kinds of concrete. There might be new kinds of steel, um, et cetera. Um, so this is where we're heading with this. And it's absolutely fascinating um, sort of understanding biological systems because they're very complex. Um, most engineers um, don't like to look at biological systems because they're messy, they have variations, they're never the same, um, and they have a lot of uncertainties. Um, but I think it's a very rewarding exercise in tackling biological systems and because they can teach us so much. Right. In fact, um, in the presentation today, you see how we're doing this. We're taking a look at a biological material, a spider web or a spider. We're trying to understand the principles, and engineers are very good at that. So engineers um, are really good in understanding the key principles and boiling down what are the essential issues, the essential features of a system and how it works. Um, and then we can build models, and once we have a model, we can do what we love to do, and that's uh, design. So we of go in the process of removing it from the actual spider web, but thinking about other things we like to build. Like I mentioned, buildings, concrete, um, transportation systems, you name it, right? There are sorts of different things we can make. Uh, and then we can use this and improve society, which is ultimately what we care about. So this really um, brings me to this um, little historical picture. You know, we think a lot about how we make stuff. Might we understand, but we're really interested in building things. And you know, when we think back in the um, 100, 200 years ago, the way we used to build things is we used to take something from nature, um, a rock or a tree, and we cut things off and we make things, we mill things, uh, and that's called subtractive manufacturing. Um, and this has changed, right? So it's been automated, but now we have a new paradigm, and the spider, in fact, has been doing this for millions and billions of years. Um, we engineers think we're so smart, we're just figuring it out. Um, of course, um, nature has already done this, what nature does, it grows things. Right? Trees grow, um, spiders build webs on the fly, and they essentially add materials where needed, and they don't cut it off. Engineers are very wasteful. Right? If we make, a, uh, we make something, we use huge amounts of energy. We cut things off, we mill things, we polish things. Um, nature doesn't do that. It adds things, and that's called additive manufacturing, and sort of the vision we have is um, what if you could grow materials? Um, what if you could have animals build buildings, what if you could have, et cetera. You can connect the dots here. So a lot of exciting things happening. Now, um, we're, we're trying this, in fact. So this is something we've been um, playing with. This is a synthetic spider web. So it looks just like a natural web, right? But it's actually made by us. And uh, we're not particularly we're proud of this, of course, but we're humble because the spiders do this every day. And it took us a couple of years to get there. Um, but we're getting there. So this is um, work with Jennifer Lewis at Harvard, um, who's an expert in 3D printing, which is one of the techniques you'll hear a little more about later today, um, which is the engineer's attempt in doing additive manufacturing. Instead of taking things away, printing things, printing materials uh, where you need it, right? And controlling the properties of these materials um, in, in different ways. So this is a web that we've made. Um, actually, it does not consist of spider silk yet. It consists of PDMS. Um, that's as far as we can do it. But eventually, um, we'll be able to use this technology in, in printing webs and making fabrics, et cetera, um, just like the spider does um, using technology. This is sort of where you see this field going. Very exciting stuff, right? So we're, um, in fact, some people might be surprised um, and say, why can't we do this yet? Well, um, engineers, um, really, we haven't really figured out exactly how the spider does this kind of process and builds the web. So um, I know that um, many of you are um, from many different disciplines, and, and I think this holds for many different ways in engineering is done in the world. Um, like I said, we, we go out and we take things from nature, like rocks or trees or any kind of product. And usually what we do, we grind it, right? Um, we heat it. Um, we produce concrete, for example, in the process. We take limestone and we grind it and heat it. Um, unfortunately, in this process, not only do we need a lot of energy to do this, um, but also we produce significant amount of CO2 in the process of making concrete. So you have a CO2 production because you need energy, which typically you burn coal, et cetera. But also, we produce CO2 in the chemical reaction that makes concrete. And then you got a process in the end where you have a powder, and then you can put, mix it with water, you make concrete. Very expensive. Um, 
very inflexible because instead of controlling things from the molecular scale, uh, we're essentially at the mercy of whatever this process does. And engineers have been trying to tweak this and improve it, but there's only so much we can do. So this is sort of the old way, I would say, of doing things, and we're working hard to change this, right? And so this is, again, how we look at nature. Now, nature is very different, right? Um, nat natural materials like webs and, and bones and your tissues, uh, they're really made from a very different starting point. They usually start from DNA. Right? So DNA is essentially a letter code that tells these proteins, these medical structures, how to look like, right? Uh, sequence, certain side chains, certain chemical functionalizations, it's all encoded by the DNA. And um, these DNA molecules encode things like proteins, which you can see here. Um, they look like long chains, right? And these long chains have functional characterizations that they self-assemble, so they know how to be able to put together to minimize the energy, so this is essentially how it works. And uh, typically, um, in, uh, in a process like in spider silk spinning, there's a processing step involved, so where these molecules are actually now exposed to changes in pH, uh, mechanical forces, flow, etc. Right, and these are little tricks that nature has in putting these molecules together in certain ways and achieving these beautiful structures that range from the molecular scale all the way to the macro scale. Now, um, these DNA molecules, of course, um, can be changed. And so as engineers, we're able to now control these DNA molecule sequences and we can design our own sequences and we can design almost any molecule we like. And you'll see later on how we've, we're trying to do this and we're trying to put them together in new ways. And so we have an opportunity in controlling the very basic molecular structure, but also um, being able to control how we put them together in a geometry like a web, we've, which we can do with 3D printing. So these technologies and ideas really come from both ends, the small and the large, and they come together at this meso scale, which is what we're really interested in understanding and, and, and building on. Um, this here um, on the right actually is a spider silk spinning duct. So this is how spider silk is produced, an actual picture of a real spider. Um, so you can see they have these little openings, which um, in fact are little channels, flow channels, in which a liquid, protein liquid, it's basically the digested product of what the spider ate. Um, these proteins are put together again into certain sequences according to DNA sequences. And a liquid is made into a solid as strong as steel within a fraction of a microsecond. Um, at room temperature, right? So f absolutely fascinating to me and, and, and to many others. And we're trying to get to the secret of how this can actually happen and how we can replicate this in the lab and in, in, in products. So, you know, but these proteins um, that are made from the DNA are extremely diverse in what they can achieve. So, you know, um, this is a picture of a cell. You might have seen this. This is your tendon, right? Um, and hopefully you have never had an injury there. But if you had, you know, it's very painful. It takes a long time to heal. So very strong uh, material that pu pulls together the muscle and your bones here in your anchor. Um, and um, then you have muscle, um, these adhesion threads that you've seen, um, very different kind of material, right? And then you have spider webs. So these are all very different kinds of things. They have very different functions, but they're made from the very same stuff. They're always made from proteins. Now the difference between them is that these proteins have different sequences. So the DNA is different of the building blocks that go into this. And so this really um, sort of um, led us to developing a theory or model that would systematically explore how you can play with these things because these are things that happen in nature, but we're really trying to make, take advantage of this for engineering applications. We're not maybe interested in building a new spider web or a new uh, tendon, but we're interested in building other things for our applications, electronic circuits, um, buildings, um, railroad tracks, um, any kind of material for uh, energy dissipation for car, for airplanes, right? So we like to grow things like that. And to do this, we need to understand. And so we developed this theory, which we call a UDP. It expresses the idea that um, very few different building blocks, proteins, with, um, which are always the same, can actually be used to create a great diversity of properties. Um, and the way to do this is by controlling structures at all different scales. And this is an eye-opening thing because engineers really tend to think only in terms of chemistry and only in terms of structure at the large scale. And here we've opened this whole new field, this whole new opportunity in scales that give us a whole new set of functions. What it means for engineers is that we're no longer limited by steel or concrete or the things we find in nature and we can grind and heat up, but actually we can work with much less um, simple proteins which we can grow in, say, soybeans. Um, and if we understand how to put them together, 
we can create enormous functions, functionalities, and things we can create and build um, that are made with much less energy, much cheaper, right? Um, and have actually better functions and are sustainable and can be recycled and you can throw them away, right? And they won't um, harm the environment. So those are um, enormous opportunities in this field. Now, of course, they're great challenges, right? Because we don't really know how to get there. And we know how spiders work, uh, how they do it, but exactly replicating this in the lab, we're not really able to. This is where the research sets in. So we're trying to, um, in our research process, um, get inspired and then use a very systematic and quantitative set of tools right, that we are very good at you know, as engineers um, and scientists and chemists, etc. We, we know how to do that. right? We can measure things. We can model things. And this is what we're doing. We now use, we call it multi-scale modeling or multi-scale experimentation where we essentially look at the same material, silk or bone or tendon or nacre or muscle threads um, at multiple scales, the single molecules, and this is sort of an, this is an experiment here where we pull on a single molecule, right? It's amazing, right? These are scales of a few nanometers. We can actually do this tensile test that you have seen in your engineering labs at the scale of a single molecule. And uh, similarly here, this movie also showed a little model of a, of a, of a molecule unfolding. Um, this movie here showed a, a larger scale picture of a muscle thread adhesion. Um, these here are little collagen fibrils at the scale of micrometers. So the idea is that we look at these materials at all different scales, and the, of course, technology to do this um, has emerged in the last 10, 15 years. Um, people have come up with all sorts of ways of measuring and quantifying and putting these things together is what we can do now. And we can um, do this by help of big computers. Right? A lot of these things require very complex calculations, have a lot of data, terabytes of data, um, which uh, we can't really keep on a little hard drive on our computer and laptop, but really need supercomputers. And this is what we do. Um, this is a little picture of a supercomputer. You've seen it, maybe. Um, it's, uh, it's just absolutely stunning. You have these thousands and millions of, of individual computers, like I have in my computer here, I think, four um, processing units. Um, these computers have millions, right? They have huge storage, terabytes, etc. So they process, they calculate data, they use models. And with these computers, one of the things we can do we can actually simulate, and again, very humble, right? Because nature does this all the time. In, in a spider, uh, you have a genetic information, and it puts these things together, and it creates a structure. But for us to understand this requires all this technology. Right? And so we put in models now where we can take the molecules, we can predict what kind of shape, what kind of function they have, just based on the genetic sequence. And this is what we call uh, protein folding or protein assembly simulations. Um, and uh, we can do this for various kinds of things, for silk, for tendon, for et cetera. And we can understand how the sequence ultimately controls the properties. Now, why do we care about this? Well, first, we, we're able to engineer the sequence. And so we're trying to play with this code that nature has and make our own things. But also, and that may be a surprising aspect of this, and you might be surprised how um, this kind of work can be done in civil engineering. And again, it speaks to the fact that it's highly multidisciplinary. It also helps us to understand disease because many diseases that humans have relate back to changes in this molecular code, in this genetic code. Right? There's a disease called brittle bone disease, and if you have this disease, um, your bones are very brittle, and it's caused by a single mutation among thousands of these letters. One letter being flipped causes this disease to have brittle bones, and you have you know, thousands and thousands of, of fractures in your lifetime. So this, in fact, is a, is a very broad impact, right? Not only do you understand how to make things work, but also you understand how things fail. And when you understand how things fail, it also helps you to build better things, and so you can prevent f failure from happening. So the insight we learn from studying brittle bone disease, in fact, we apply in making better concrete on the other side. And this is what our group is trying to do. So an extremely interesting field, and you really need um, many different people with very different backgrounds, right? So we work with people with chemistry background, um, engineering background, civil background, structures, uh, chemical engineering, biology, etc. Now, this is sort of gives you an idea of how this, um, what this method can do. Um, these computational tools are very powerful now. Um, we can actually predict, um, you know, shapes of structures. This here is a molecule. Um, it's called elastin molecule, and it's the basic element in your skin. Um, in your lungs and your blood vessels that makes these stretchy and deformable. Very important, obviously. And so we, um, we're trying to understand what shape do these molecules have. And you might be surprised. We don't know 
how these very important elastin molecules really look like and how they make your skin and your lungs and your blood vessels elastic. And again, this is an area where um, a lot of diseases relate to malfunctions of those. So your blood vessels become brittle and rigid, um, or your lungs don't expand. So this kind of work now with these experimental techniques, we can actually measure the shape of these very tiny molecules, and we can compute the distribution of atoms and molecules within this structure. And this is just an example, a snapshot of how you can combine now computational methods, experimental methods, and tie them together. And you need to do this interactively. So we work with teams and groups all over the world. In fact, this is a collaboration with Australia because people who work on these problems are usually only very few in the world. And so you need to be able to connect with them across countries, continents, etc., cetera, um, and make an impact. So this is very exciting. So um, we, we have done this uh, not only for elastin, for silk, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about silk which is um, actually a much simpler material than elastin, um, and um, <clears throat> um, a, a very interesting material because of its strength. And so this is the structure how silk looks like. So if you were to look into a spider web uh, with a high, very, very good microscope, um, you could see that. Um, now, there exists no microscope that can actually visualize this, and so we need the computational models to help us visualize the structures, and this is what you see on this, on this picture here. Um, once we have models like these and we know about the structure, um, it's sort of thinking about a building, right, or a car. If you, if you do a calculation of a crash impact in your car or an airplane, um, you need a model, a 3D model, a CAD model, right? And so this is the analogy to that um, at the very tiny scales of atoms and molecules. And what you can do with this now, just like if you have an impact crash simulation of a car, um, you can simulate deformation and pooling and stress um, in a protein, like in a silk protein, this is what we've done here. So we've pulled on this protein. This is not really a mass, but it's a symbol for this. And in fact, we apply forces at the scale of molecules using light. So the, the forces induced by light are enough um, to deform and, and break molecules apart. And so we can measure how they break and how they essentially, well, if they don't break, how they keep materials together. And so this is how this looks like. So we can measure exactly how these molecules actually unfold, how they break and what the mechanisms are, and we find um, amazing things. For example, that um, building these molecules very small is really important. If you make them too big, um, if you make them uh, just a few nanometers, that's a tenth, that's a billionth of a meter, right? Very, very tiny. Um, if you make them just a few billionth of a meter too large, a few nanometers too large, they become very fragile and break very easily. And in fact, um, that's something we've used, we've ex ex examined both experimentally and computationally. So we, we can simulate, we can model these processes, and we can make silks actually with different kinds of um, sizes of these, of these little crystals, these little protein crystals. Um, and we can explain um, why the nanoscale features, the nanoscale dimensions are so critical. And this is important um, because engineers were beginning, just beginning to understand what are these effects at the nanoscale? How do these things work? What matters? Because these things are so tiny that uh, we can't see them with our eyes. So but, um, it's a whole new area of engineering, uh, in fact, when you're trying to play with these kind of structures. And so we, we do this. We also. Um, um, try to understand how larger scale structures work, and so we put these uh, many molecules together and forming fibers. Now that are on the scale of a few micrometers, and this is something you can actually begin to see with your eyes. And in fact, spider webs are made from threads that are on the order of a few few micrometers. Right? And so, the models and the experiments can be scaled up to that level now, where um, we can model and understand how these entire th threads of, of silk actually behave. And so we can measure, again, like you've seen before, their strength. Um, we can measure the extreme strength of a few gigapascal, which is um, the strength of steel. And I'd like to point out to you here, um, I told you it's much easier to break steel. Well, so if you imagine steel and you pull it, you can only break it, you can only pull it by a tiny bit and then it breaks. Now, spider silk threads, um, if you have ever pulled that one, um, if you can go home and try it on, on a web, you can stretch it a lot. Right? And we, we measure this by a quantity called strain. In fact, some silks you can strain by a couple of times of their lengths. And so imagine um, having steel. So the strength, the force needed per unit area is the same as in steel, but you have to stretch it by several times the length of the steel cable in order to break it. So this is an enormous amount of energy that you need. And um, which is why silk is one of the toughest materials that exists, in fact, in, in, in this world. Um, but what's truly remarkable is the fact that it's actually made with so little. 
right? It's only um, the spider eating a couple of insects, um, processing them, digesting them, using the DNA to make new proteins, and then putting them together in this magical way and creating these spider webs. So it's, it's fascinating. And, um, well, so in our work, we, we have been able to explain how these molecular structures control um, these mechanical properties. We've been able to visualize um, sort of the stresses and forces, of those of you who have seen this, um, within the fibers. And so you can imagine, just like you've visualized uh, stresses in a car, in a building, in an airplane, um, we can now visualize the stresses within the molecules, within the fibers. And this is what you see in this picture here. Um, and we can build theories, right, and models to explain what these different effects are. And so, you know, this gets uh, quite technical here, but the message is that we, we can now begin to engineer things. We, we have a model, we have a theory, and we can ask questions like, what if you change this? What if you change the sequence of silk? What if you change the geometry of the web? Um, what will change in the properties, right? And so um, this really um, led us eventually to also exploring questions like, how do spider webs behave? And we build models of spider webs. We pull the spider webs mechanically. And we've also done this experimentally, right? So we've done experiments where we take spider webs and we try to break them. Um, to understand how strong they are and how they fail. Um, and this um, was fascinating. We found that spider webs, in fact, are very resilient and very hard to break. Uh, not only is the spider very, the spider silk very strong, but also the web itself is a very resilient mechanical structure. And this, of course, is very important. The insights learned from this are very important in the design of, of structures of any kind of engineered structures. Um, and we've learned that this particular feature of these um, webs being so tolerant to damage. So what we found here is that um, when you try to break a web, the amount of damage you induce is very small. Um, in engineered materials, the damage tends to be much larger. Right? And so this gives us specific insight into how to make things more robust, more stable in engineering. Um, that's a little movie um, that shows one of the simulations of the web. So you can see we've actually been able to build models of these webs. Um, essentially informed from the molecular scale. So we've, we've incorporated the molecular sequence information and scaled it up and build models like these here. Um, and you know, what it allows us to do is to pull these things together to so understand how the DNA sequence uh, creates proteins, how the proteins come together to form a, a mesostructure, um, a composite structure, how the web is built, how the web behaves. And, and we can link this back, all the way back to the molecular scale. Right? And so now with these kind of models, we're able to um, um, play with this, right? And this is now um, probably the most interesting part now, to me it's the most interesting part, is to engineer this, to change this. Right? And so what we do in this, in this work now, I'm going to show you a couple of, couple of case studies, this being the first one, um, is where we take the, the insights now. So we've, you've seen, we've looked at these silk proteins and we've understood how they play together to form these uh, really interesting threads, very strong, how they form webs, how the webs are very resilient. Um, but now, what if you change it? What can we do to make our own silk? And uh, to do this, we basically play with the naturally occurring sequence. So we take the naturally occurring DNA sequence, and we take a piece out, and we pull it together differently. So sort of what you have there are two building blocks. We call it A and B, right? And the A building block, this is a sequence in the pattern of DNA that makes these crystals. And there's a B, which makes these more amorphous, disorganized, disorganized structures. And you know, in nature, it's a combination of A and B and A and B many times. So what we did is we decided, well, why don't we change it up a little bit? And, and instead of having A, B, A, B, we're going to have A. We're going to have B and three A's. Or we have one A and three B's. Right? And so there's a couple of messages here. One is, of course, that you know, we can do this. Right? In fact, we can model this. We can understand this um, with a computer, with a with a pen and paper calculation, but also we can make it experimentally. We can actually go in the lab and we can use bacteria um, that will make us these proteins, right? So uh, we, we don't use spiders for this. We use bacteria to make proteins. And this is a common technique now in, in bioengineering. Um, and then we're trying to create, make these proteins into fibers. And of course, um, the spiders have these beautiful spinning structures, right? You've seen this picture exactly like this before, a little smaller. Um, these spider threads come out. Um, and now, what exactly happens there, we don't know. So what we need to do is really pull together a very multidisciplinary team. And this is another example of how we're connecting really across different disciplines, departments, even universities. So this is our, a team from, um, from MIT. Tufts University and, uh, and BU, Boston University. And so we work on the simulation, the modeling. 
Um, David Kaplan, he uses bacteria to make these proteins according to the designs that we come up with. Um, and in fact, this little table here, this shows the DNA letters. So we can tell him these are the letters we like, um, and then he makes these proteins using bacteria. And then Joyce Wong at BU, um, she, she developed the technology in spinning these protein solutions into a fiber uh, using a microfluidic device. So now you're dealing with fluid mechanics, right, because we're having a fluid that turns into a solid, as strong as steel. Um, you know, David, obviously, he has a lot of biologists in his lab, um, chemical biology, et cetera, um, dealing with bacteria, um, living systems, and then we do the modeling and the mechanics, right? So it's a very diverse group of people involved here, um, a group of probably 10 people as a whole, students, faculty, postdocs, undergrads, et cetera. And um, what we're trying to do is trying to mimic nature. Now, um, I have, I'm very, we have to be very humble as engineers. So this is the, 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 the spinning duct that you've seen. If you slice it, this is how it looks like. In fact, it's a very complicated three-dimensional geometry, this channel flow inside the spider by which the spider produces these silk threads. Um, as engineers, we, um, we thought, let's come up with a simple first-order approximation, which is the strength of engineers. Right? We like to simplify things. So what we did is we created a flow channel where it's a thick flow here, and then it thins out. And we um, inject a solution and change the pH, because we know that spiders do this to create these threats. And so we're trying to um, create fibers that way. Um, in fact, it works to some degree. And so we have created um, synthetic designs of these fibers. And we, uh, you know, again, we take these proteins that we have designed with these different sequences. Uh, we model them. Um, so we model the molecular structure using those techniques I've shown you before, uh, using big computers. Uh, and then we simulate, we simulate the experiment of flowing these proteins through the solution and making fibers. Um, and we also experimentally do that, right? And so we measure what comes out of the other side, um, and we can understand the differences. So this here is the, the sequence that has called AB3, and that turns out to form a nice fiber. The other sequence does not form a fiber. And so what you see in an experiment is sort of a, a global structure. It looks like a big mess, no fiber. Um, and now, this is an example. Now, in experiment, you can see this with a you know, microscope, but you cannot see within the molecular structure. But the model can do this. And so the model actually teaches us, tells us why this sequence forms a fiber, and this one doesn't. And the explanation is here. You can see this material, these individual lines are the proteins. And it shows you that these proteins are actually very well connected. They form a nice network um, that makes a mechanically strong thing, fiber. Now, these proteins here, you can see they're only loosely connected, and that explains why um, they're not loosely connected. Um, they essentially fall apart, and they form these um, really messy kind of, kind of arrangements. And this now is exactly where engineers like to be. We like to understand the principles, and we have a model now. And then we like to think, how can we improve on this? And we then um, designed new sequences, right? Um, that make even better fibers, even stronger fibers. And we you know, if go through this here. We can change the length of these proteins, what we did here. And we can see they make actually much better connectivity now. Um, and this really is driven by combining the insight from the experiment and the simulation and the model and to come up with something new. That, so it's an it's a interesting area, right? Because you can't see this with your eyes. You can measure how it looks like and how it behaves. But you really have to rely on your model. You have to rely on your experiment. And then you make a product from this. And you can engineer these very, very tiny scales by doing this. Um, and then we can measure this experimentally as well. And so we've done um, these experiments here. Um, and we've shown if you make these proteins longer, you change the sequence to make them longer. In fact, they behave better. And they give you stronger, stronger materials. All right. Um, so now what we're doing with this now is we're trying to um, you know, pull these things together in, um, in this 3D printing idea, right? So you've seen this web before. And so what we now have, and, and we're trying to sort of um, in baby steps achieve, is to create fibers completely synthetically from proteins that we've made using bacteria. So we don't need the spider anymore, um, really. Um, but the thing the spider does, of course, it spins a web, right? And it, it walks around and makes these different threads. And so that we can mimic using 3D printing. And so this is the work I've shown you before with Jennifer. Um, here. Um, so it's basically a robotic arm that has a spinning duct in there. Uh, currently, we spin a polymer. But the next step will be to spin the silk. Um, and you can see how that allows us you know, to control much larger structural scales. And you know, now we're in a position now where you can control the protein molecular structure. You can control how it's put together. 
but you can also control the structure, the design at your macro scale. Right? And this is sort of what we're doing. We have different geometries of webs. And of course, a spider, we can't talk to the spider and tell the spider, please make a web that has twice as many threads or a different kind of threads. Uh, the spider doesn't listen to us. Um, but the 3D printing allows us to do this. And so we can use this very effectively as a tool, as scientists or engineers, in, in asking questions, right? Um, and ultimately in making better things. So the last thing I want to show you is um, some other work we've been doing also with 3D printing, and I think an amazing field as well. Now going away from silk um, and thinking about how we make very strong composites. You know that uh, composites sort of putting different materials that are very different, like very strong and very light, or very extensible and very rigid. Um, you put these things together, engineers have already figured out this is a very effective way of making things even better than just adding the two sums. In fact, you get a synergistic effect, and that's what we call a composite. And so, you know, natural systems also, of course, have figured this out, except a couple billion years ago, uh, not just 100 years ago like we did. Um, and in fact, they have done it in a much better way in some, in some, in some degree, um, because their structural control, the kind of features they control, just like in silk, uh, really ranges all the way from the molecular scale, how atoms are arranged, all the way to the shape of bones, right, or these seashells. So amazing stuff. And we worked on, you know, understanding systems and combining them and, and making materials that are even better than any materials that exist today. Um, and um, nature has a, a clear, clear path for us here to teach us, right? And so um, now, how do we get there? Well, we, um, we study nature. This is, uh, for example, just like we've shown you the pictures of silk at the molecular scale. These are pictures of bone at the molecular scale. Um, that's your hydroxyapatite, your calcium that you eat or you drink in milk. And then these are the proteins, the collagen protein. That, these two make your bone. So calcium is very brittle and very fragile. And collagen, it's jello. Right? So jello and calcium, put things, things together, um, you get bone. That's pretty amazing, right? Um, now, of course, if you just mix them in your, in your kitchen mixer, it doesn't work like that. Um, so you need something else, right? And this is, again, what we're trying to figure out. Um, and of course, in, in humans, it's the cells, et cetera, that grow these bones, very complicated. They can heal, they can, they can live, they live. They're living, li living tissues, really. Um, but we're, again, humble and trying to replicate some of these ideas. Now, let me jump um, to some of those things we've done here. So what you find in, these, uh, in materials like bone and nacre and seashells is that they form these Again, hierarchies of structures, you know, from the nano scale all the way to the structural scale. And what we did now is we copied some of those designs we found in nature, and we're trying to make them in the lab. Now, how do we do this? Um, we don't want to use cells in this case, bone cells or anything. We want to use 3D printers. And so this um, is something that we actually were able to do because 3D printing has advanced to some level where we can now print multiple materials at the scale of a few tens of microns. Think about this, right? So this is tens of microns, very, very tiny. And you can print different kinds of materials, very stiff, very soft, very fragile. And so this led us to the idea that why don't we print bone um, in 3D printing, using 3D printing. And this is what we did here. Um, so we created, in fact, we created different designs. We took from different natural materials. Um, and we, we tested them. And what we do is we, um, we like to break them because one of, the achieving, one of the objectives here is to make them very strong and tough, very hard to break. So we, um, we add a little fracture in there, which you've maybe seen in your engineering classes, uh, and we pull it. And the, the fractures lead to a stress concentration. They make very high stresses locally, which is why the cracks tend to grow, which is a terrible thing, right? So nature has figured out that in order to avoid cracks from growing, you need to get rid of these stress concentrations. So these high stresses at the tip of the crack um, need to be mitigated. And so what you can do, if you create these hierarchical structures, if you create these combinations of soft and stiff, you can actually achieve this. And you can have a situation where cracks are no longer dangerous for a structure. And this is well, what we like to be, right? And so we go in. Uh, we theoretically study this. We explore you know, computationally designs. We optimize. And then we use the 3D printing in, in doing this. And so what we use uh, here is um, we use a computational method. We use an experimental method. And we make these materials. We can actually go straight from our computer model. We push a button. It's not as easy yet as pushing a button. You have to, the grad students have to do some work in translating the files from one another. But it's pretty much like that. Uh, and then you go and send to the printer, and they make the material for you. A couple of hours later, you pick it up. And uh, you can test it, right? This is a tensile test now. And this is, in fact, this is how this is amazing how the printer looks like. So the printer, you can see, 
it prints these um, bluish, light blue and dark blue materials. These are the two materials, very stiff and very soft. I, I could have brought one. It's almost like one is like very flexible rubber. The other one is like a very, very rigid um, polymer that you might find in a, in a car, right? Um, in a car bumper. So something like, um, like a balloon rubber and then, uh, you know, sort of the bumper like in a car. Um, and you can combine them at scales of a few micrometers, right? And this is what the printer does. So it essentially puts materials down in three dimensions, so you can do any, any geometry you like. That's, to me, it's pretty amazing, right? I can come up with any geometry, including the ones, especially the ones that nature has not figured out yet, right? Or not even tried, or not even need, needs to try. And these are dog bones, right? You've seen those. Have you done those? STM specimens when you do mechanical testing. So we print also individual materials in the kind of engineering geometries, right? You, you've seen those, I'm sure, in your classes. Um, and we test them, right? And then we can, you know, do a systematic analysis. Um, we've shown that both materials by themselves are actually completely useless. They're both very brittle. I mean, they're extensible. The black one is the polymer, the rubber-like polymer, but it breaks quite easily. This one as well, it's very brittle. Um, they're useless now, but if you put them together, just like the jello and calcium, also by themselves, you might not think you could grow a human bone from this, um, but that's what happens. And here, we've used a 3D printer in making this, and in fact, you can see how these uh, materials both in the model and the experiment, are able to distribute those stresses significantly, right? And so the crack actually is no longer dangerous. And if you want to break this material, you need a lot of energy, a lot of force, which means toughness. That's what we engineers call toughness. Um, and that's what we like to have, high toughness materials. In fact, this is what we've created here. So this here is a material now that's 20, 20 more times larger, stronger, tougher, than the toughest of the building blocks. So you can see this synergistic multiplying effect in there that we've demonstrated here. And we've looked at this with microscopes and so on and, um, and looked at other kind of effects. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm out of time, but um, um, the, the idea really, and let me jump to the end, is that by, by looking at these multiple scales, sort of studying them using sort of a science approach, and this is where engineering, of course, needs a lot of science, and we work very closely with scientists. We do science sometimes ourselves. And then we think what we've learned, and we then translate these insights into building our own things. This is what I think why engineering is so exciting, because you work at the interface between science, or you do the science yourself, but then you go a step beyond, and you don't just look at what you have, but you design and create something new that has not existed yet. Um, and the thing that we've been quite you know, amazed by is this connection between the chemistry and the macro scale and everything in between, which I think is a new frontier in engineering, that maybe in 20 years or 30 years uh, will be what everyone does in creating things. Um, but today, that's really just sort of um, scratching the surface at this point. Um, and if you're, if you're interested, um, that's a book in fact, I wrote it with my grad student. Steve, Steve Cranford uh, was my graduate student. He had a, um, a civil engineering background um, from Canada. He's from Canada. Um, and, um, we, and he worked on these nanoscience, nanotechnology um, aspects. He worked on the spider web. And so he, he learned, his undergraduate was on structures, right? And he learned how to deal with nanoscale things and chemistry. And then by the time he was done, we decided to wrote a book. So we wrote a book together and summarizing some of these things. So if you're interested in reading, uh, you know, really we have a couple of introductory chapters that are for broad audiences. Um, you can check this out. You might have it in your library. And it talks about, you know, the inspiration from nature and how we can design things and make things. All right, so I'm going to end with this here, which is just a picture of a spider. Um, which is this still mysterious and how they work and how they do things um, and keeps us going every day and trying to, trying to understand and build. Thank you very much. We realize that some of you have uh, classes at 12, so we understand you may have to quietly slip out, but we, we are not going to leave the room at 12. We want to give ample opportunity for any questions that the audience may have. And so, any questions? One there, and then we'll go over there. So, um, <coughs> I was curious, because I, I don't know much about spider webs. Um, so, how do you account for the, uh, sort of the life cycle of the properties of, of silk in some of your experiments? Or is that something that you're going to address later? Start out with assumptions that the, the web was just woven and it has whatever the protein properties are and the proteins have not degraded in any way. So. 
Yeah, you, you raised a couple of really great points. OK, so, so, so one of the questions, and I think you're, you're getting at, is this, the, the change of properties over time, right? And which is really a weakness of a spider web. You know, spider webs, obviously, you know, they're great and they're a strength of steel, but after a couple of weeks, maybe, or years, well, sure, after a couple of years, they look like cobwebs, and they're completely useless. So, you know, properties degrade, um, and we look at, you know, f freshly created systems that have ideal properties, but there's a decay of those properties over time, um, which we, we, in our own work, haven't explored or studied yet. But it is something that, you know, in fact, drives us in going to engineer polymers and engineer systems, and, and actually, um, you know, the work you've seen on the, um, the 3D printing is created from completely synthetic engineering polymers, which are known to have a very uh, durable materials. But we use the ideas, the insights, and in how the structures are made and how the combinations look like um, in creating something like that, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, just copying a spider web and thinking you can now create a new construction material, say, uh, wouldn't work, likely, right? Uh, because it lacks certain properties that we, we like about concrete and steel. Um, so we, we want to take the, the best from both worlds and the insights um, and then build it from scratch, essentially, using our own building blocks, which might be, you know, yeah, minerals, steel, ceramics, you name it. I mean, we're applying different things here. Yeah. My, my question was related. I, I was looking to talk about the plasticity of, of silk, and, you know, I wouldn't want to drive across a bridge that was, you know, <laughs> that was very plastic. So what are the applications that you would have for this silk? I think it's kind of related. Yeah. So, right, so silk itself exactly has, actually is a very extensible material, and if you, um, if you were to build, you actually were to take silk and you were to create a bridge, right, it, it would be very, might be very floppy, right, and then you might not want to um, drive on it. Um, so, so that's another thing clearly where um, if we were to use something like silk as a platform, um, we would want to create a much stiffer material, maybe with the same kind of strength, um, and in fact, the, among the seven silks, so you've seen, you know the silks that you have in a copper, but, actually, but silk spiders have multiple different kinds of silks, and some actually are very stiff and rigid. Um, and so you, you could sort of play with those, um, or you can change the sequence altogether and create something that's much more like a rigid polymer, but has the same strength and toughness as silk, and so you can try to combine these properties. Um, but again, um, like, like you indicated also, um, the most viable strategy probably is to go away from a protein-based product. And you would then go and see, you know, practically, how could we change concrete? You know, let's say we work with concrete. How could we change concrete in a clever way um, that incorporates some of those features of silk? And, you know, knowing that if you look at concrete structure, um, it's completely random. I mean, you take the minerals from the rocks and you heat them and you, and there's absolutely no control of a structure, almost. Um, if you could tweak the structure, if you could, say, design certain features, um, you could potentially increase properties, durability, and strength, and toughness by manifold, potentially. Right? So that's what I would see as a more pra practical um, sort of impact. But silk, um, in, in, the, in the work you've maybe seen on the first slide, I cited the NIH as one of the major funding agencies behind this work. And we, we actually have a lot of support from them. And their silk is. Um, actually, um, um, a biomaterial used for implants and tissue engineering, and um, and this is again, it's interesting when people see me present this sometimes, and they say you're in the in the civil engineering department. How come you? But really, it's connected, right? And you know, the mechanics of how silk works um, is the same as for many other materials. But then, silk has an advantage biologically that it um, it is um, biocompatible, right? and you can in fact use, and this has been used for you know, in, in many, it's been forgotten actually by us maybe, but in, in ancient civilizations, silk was used as sutures. Um, because you can use silk and you can put it as implants and your body will not reject it. And, and again, it's an example how engineers actually thought they're so clever and we create all these biomaterials and you put them as, you know, as hip implants, etc. And you have all these rejections and, and the body will, will think there's a foreign object in, in there. With silk, it doesn't happen. And so there's a lot of really significant interest in the biomedical community. You know, you can code, uh, you know, metals and steel and polymers with silk and make them biocompatible. Or what we are doing also is we're mixing silk proteins into other polymers, right, and trying to get, again, the best of both worlds. So you can get the silk will help you to create a strong scaffold 
and then you put other proteins, like you can put an elastin protein in there, the one you've seen before. Um, and the elastin protein will basically tell your cells to grow skin. So now you can make a scaffold to make a shape of something. And then uh, you add the elastin as a way of telling cells to make certain other things. Um, and you can grow tissues by this. And you can send with liver proteins. You can imagine that. And there's signatures for those. So you can grow sorts of tissues with this. So the, in the biomedical field, the silk itself has immediate application. There's, there's a lot of interest in, in just that. And they, and of course, the biomedical engineers um, are waiting um, desperately to find a way of making silk synthetically um, in large quantities for cheap. And so these microfluidics devices that we were developing in, in our project you know, go towards that goal in being able to spin our own silk. Um, and then the 3D printing, right, it looks like a, like a, just like a little example of the web, but actually the real application, of course, is to make scaffolds, right? So we can 3D print um, a piece of tissue. We can measure the tissue in the patient um, using tomography and then print that tissue scaffold with the kinds of silks we have designed, with the kinds of proteins we want to put in, like liver protein or skin protein, um, and then implant it and have the body take care of it itself. So those are the kinds of things we're doing. Um, and it, you know, in that sense, we're very broad in the impact we see um, because we're at a, such a fundamental scale of playing with atoms and molecules and structures. Um, and that's, in fact, you know, ultimately what um, a lot of the engineering is about, right? We're trying to help society, civilization in, in, in advancing and, and being healthy and being able to do to live. Um, and all these aspects actually play with that theme and help in that, in that sense. So, it, you know, the, the disciplines we've created were quite artificial, right? I mean, we've created the biomedical engineer and the civil engineer and the electrical engineer, when in reality, uh, you know, a lot of engineering is about sustaining these society and making, creating health and so on. And, you know, when we go to that scale, um, these boundaries between the disciplines really go away. And now you're, all the time, all the time you have an impact in the biomedical field, the next day you talk to a concrete engineer and um, that person tells you, wow, I can make better concrete by adding a little silk protein. You know, so you can, you can see this kind of potentially has a very broad impact. Okay, uh, let me ask a question. So what you discussed is very interesting, but at the same time it is crossing the boundaries of many disciplines. How do you make this happen that students across the board can talk to each other? What kind of curriculum you have in place? Mm. It's, a, it's a real tough one. I mean, we, um, so most of the students involved, you know, if they're undergraduates, they're, much, they're involved in a smaller project. Um, obviously in what they do. Um, so undergrads work on this research, they, they will see a small piece, but they're, they're being exposed in this project. For example, to group meetings, they're gonna meet the, the postdoc who does the cell experiments and then they see the microfluidic device. So they get an exposure to this. Um, the grad students, um, they learn it essentially on their job and they are you know, in control of a much bigger piece of this project. But um, you know, educationally, um, what the undergraduates who go in this and then the grad students rely on are you know, fundamentals, right? Like, you know, dealing with, um, you know, measuring, understanding mechanics, right? Understanding um, math, building models. And ultimately, it's um, once you've understood how to build a model and how to solve a differential equation, how, about how to derive the differential equation, how to solve it, how to apply boundary conditions, and how to assess your prediction with an experiment that you do and then how to validate and how to make design and so on. You can do it for anything, right? So I would say, you know, and we're still improving the way we educate, actually, and especially along the lines of what you asked. Um, but overall, we believe that fundamentals are, are key. And then you give applications like case studies, examples, and it could be, you know, could be a structure, could be an implant, could be, you know, depending on what discipline you're in. Um, but if, if the student knows the fundamentals, and has understood every piece in the process of creating the model and validating and using for design and so on, um, you, you can usually learn all the other things. Uh, from my understanding, uh, spider uh, oil has a property that uh, helps to stick uh, insects. Like yeah. there is a viscous property, viscosity type property yeah. spider oil pad. Uh, so when you are printing the same type of silk in your lab, uh, does it contain all that prepared? No. 
Yeah, right, great. So in fact, so the sticky protein is a coating that is one of those seven proteins the spiders can make, um, right? And what the spider does, it actually, this is, I mean, the spider, in fact, I don't know if I mentioned, the spider actually is a, is a, is a multi-material 3D printer. You know, something we're, we're trying, just beginning to, to develop and use in engineering. And, you know, they can do this at a much finer scale. You know, yeah, they make this the web, and then they coat the web, the sticky protein. Um, and then they, they're able to use it for catching prey. They can walk on it even without being, being stuck themselves, right? Um, we don't have that, right? I mean, we're struggling to get one of, one of those silks to be, to, make, to be made in the lab. Uh, and, uh, you know, ultimately we'll be able to maybe do the coding, but um, that's not something we've even tried. So to speaking to this material selection, I mean, you can even, what well, we're, um, sometimes I talk about materials by design and some of the presentations I give, and, you know, in fact, uh, actually I can go to this, <coughs> these Ashby, you've seen those Ashby plots, right? Um, so what you can do, in fact, with this here, and, and, you know, is you can pick a point, and what you do traditionally, you can say, all right, let's pick from a library of stuff we have, or, you know, let's take a good look at this. You know, we can now say, and this is what eventually I think this field will morph, morph into, in, not in a couple of years, but maybe in a couple of decades or so, um, that you can pick this point and you can say, as a, and this is an important thing, as a design engineer, right now you, you pick materials available and the materials engineer might not be on the table um, when these design decisions are made. But now, if you're a designer of a building, a car, an airplane, or a microchip, you can say, wow, I can, I can work with any material here uh, in, this, in this domain, right? So this is the, the, the modulus and this is the hardness. You can combine this with anything you like. And, and you can come up with solutions that maybe are, you know, look unconventional, right? You can say, I'm going to pick a material here, and one here, and one here, and I'm going to build a composite, and I think this composite is going to have tremendous properties, and that can solve problems we've never had before. Now, currently, there's no way of making these materials, but I, what nature teaches us, and also what these, these diversity of properties we already have, you know, shows us is, in fact, we can dial in any property almost we like. Um, using those platforms of controlling structures at multiple scales, etc. So this is, I think, where this is heading. And, and again, this will, be, this will take a couple of decades, but this would be the, the vision, right? And so now, and then, not only do you, do, you, does, do you assume it's there, but you can actually print it. I mean, this would be the best, right? Just like, you know, 200 years ago, you needed a, the, to print a book, you needed to go to a, there was only one place in the world probably you could print a book, right? And, you know, so now you have factories and so on, right? But now, and now you have the internet, you can print your own book. Um, down the road, you know, you'll be able to, uh, you know, design things, invent things, and then your 3D printer or whatever name it might have, you know, makes it for you. And that's um, it's just in terms of what you can invent. So think about this, um, you know, your kids or grandkids maybe, I don't know, or um, be able to invent things and then make them immediately. Imagine a collective, you know, intelligence we would have if we can do this. So all of us have some great ideas, but now, um, we can't make certain things and you need a machine shop and even today, right? And you need a certain mechanician who tells you, oh, a mechanic, oh, this is how you make this kind of surface. You know, down the road, um, it's your imagination and other people's and then you can invent all sorts of things. I believe, in fact, a lot of technologies will be multiplied in, in how we invent stuff beyond just, you know, the, the technique itself. So the, the innovation space, I think, is enormous if everyone can do that. Well, a question, right? Well, uh, you did mention about the previous question. Um, I just wanted to add to it. Uh, is, say, for example, the proteins, uh, the sticky proteins, uh, are they known in terms of modeling? Very good model, then? 
we, we haven't tried to mo model those yet. Yeah, you, you can model those, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have another um, project which is actually is, um, funded by a company that makes adhesives. Um, you know, so like super glue. And, uh, um, and actually, in this, they, they're interested in, and we, we're working on, with this company on, on that question, essentially, for their engineered uh, systems. And we're trying to, you know, maybe down the road, um, you know, model the sticky protein in silk, but they're, you know, interested in, in having a, a shorter term impact on their products. But that's exactly what we're trying to do there. So we're modeling the, um, the adhesiveness of, of different polymers, and, and what they're interested in is currently they essentially they played with parameters and they tweaked it and they came up with certain mixtures that work and that's what you have when you, if you buy glue that's what's in there and now what we're trying to do is essentially apply this paradigm of multi-scale structuring and ask fundamentally what if what if you could you know change the molecular length what if you could have different patterns of organization what kind of adhesive properties would you get and so you know we can do this but yeah we could apply the same technique that we use there also silk proteins could be done. Yeah, we just never didn't. I mean, and this is a field. Uh, you, you, in fact, you, uh, and luckily, you find a lot of stuff you can do. Um, we, you know, this is just us doing this, but I'm hoping that more and more people will be interested and excited about this kind of work um, because it needs the whole, you know, the whole community really to do this to really make an impact. Uh, you know, we're very small. Any other questions? Oh. I, have, I have a question. So then, how soon do you think we'll be able to, like, Make complex body structures such as limbs, so we can just 3D print out if I lose an arm or something like that, even nerves. Yeah. Well, it's probably a long uh, that 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 probably is a long a long time, and unfortunately, right? And we when we talk about these, um, when we we had a, this paper about printing bone. We get a lot of questions like this. People ask us, you know, when can you print, you know, functional working bones for humans? And I don't know. I mean, this is a um, um, it's a longer time, and I don't. I'm not really in a position to answer that, uh, you know, detail. So one of the challenges is that you can make a limb that looks like a limb, but functionality requires how it interfaces with you as a human. So how is your blood going to go through that limb? Or if it's not going to go through the limb, how are you going to interface it so that it moves like it needs to, right? And so there's a whole lot of dimensions. What if you're not talking about a limb? What if you're talking about a heart or a liver, right? So how that interfaces with the body ends up being a big part of what you have to look at. So. Mm -hmm. Right behind you. Uh, yes, uh, in the world, and we, we understand that there are different species of uh, spiders. Uh, do the shear and torsional properties differ? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, we've done a little bit of work on this. Um, in fact, so we did. We we looked at different lineages of spider uh, in, the, in the development of trees. So the, the ecologists tell us there are certain times when you know, a spider species split up into two main trees and so on. And you know, so we actually started classifying their mechanical properties and the geometry of webs. They all build different webs. And you can find correlations between, say, how strong the silk is and how large the webs are and what kind of prey they, they catch and where they build the webs. So if they built it in windy environments or if they built it in a, you know, in a in a more in a quiet environment where they have traps, so animals walk into this, or the animals fly into this. So there's all sorts of correlations, in fact, between the mechanical or material property and the ecology, essentially how these spiders use those webs. Um, and that's, um, like I said, we have started a little bit of this, but it's um, you know, again one of these huge, enormous fields, right? Because now the uh, the the ecology community, the biology ecology community. Um, never really thinks about material properties you know, as something they use to explain. You know, there's some, some very few, in fact, there are very few papers out there. Um, but this sort of tells them you know, the mechanics and, and how that looks like. Not only the sequence of proteins is important, but how they, how they build the web and what kind of strength and shear properties they have. And it might help them, in turn, to explain some of the biology that's happening in these species. Yeah, it's absolutely. Um, it's an, it's an interesting new field in ecology, I would argue. Um, I don't know if anyone has done this or picked it up or anything, but it's a very interesting one combining ecology and material, ecology and material science, essentially. So maybe for some of you, um, you know, something to do.